Hello, welcome to Ernest Prattle. And you might say, who's Ernest Prattle? Well, it's me, Paul Wardle. It's my little corner, my little enclave of joy and conversation. And today, I've got a really special guest for you all, uh, a really good friend of mine, uh, she's basically a, an author, um, she's a radio DJ, she's a uh, founder of the Moz Army and also presents the Rock and Roll Book Club and it's the lovely Julie Hamill. So all being well, that's bringing Julie into the conversation, so here we go. Hello! Hi! Hello Julie, how are you? Very good, Paul Wardle. Thank you very much. So I was going <laughs> to just do my little intro there to say what a fantastic person you are, Julie, and, and all the things that you, you do in your, in your spare time. Um, I just wanted to start, Julie, if it's okay with yourself. If, for those that don't know who Julie Hamill is, would you be kind enough to, to give us a little bit of a background about who you are, where you came from, and where you are at the moment. Sure. Thanks very much for that lovely introduction, which I've yet to hear, so I'm hoping it's good. Pleasure, pleasure. <laughs> um, uh, I'm Julie Hamill. I'm an author and broadcaster. I live in London, and I lived in Scotland, grew up in Scotland until I was about 18, 19, and then moved to London. Worked in advertising for a long time for big agencies that, that took me to live in New York for five years, which was fantastic. Um, then had two children, came back to London and restarted my career as a writer. Um, and out of that became a presenter as well. And that's it. And now I'm on the radio and we know each other through Morrissey. That's correct, Boogaloo Radio. I mean, we, we know each other it's through the Mozomi, I believe, Julie. Yeah. Yeah, the Moz Army, the, the, the greatest Army. hashtag. And just to explain yeah. what that is, uh, it's basically um, a Smith's Morrissey related disco event, which is run from the Star and Garter pub in Manchester. It happens once a year and it's, it's obviously organised by the fantastic Julie Hamill there. And uh, <laughs> we have uh, people from all four corners of the world congregate on this one pub in Manchester. Um, there's usually a, a coach trip, a bus trip in the daytime, uh, going around all the sites in Manchester related to the Smiths and Morrissey. Then it's followed by a nighttime disco, and there's a mozioki, uh, there's the uh, that famous raffle, cobble cut out of Morrissey. And mm. yeah, it's a fantastic event. You get to meet people from all over the place. I definitely, definitely recommend it. But um, Obviously, due to the current circumstances, Julie, how are we looking for the next event at the moment? Hard to say. We're right on the cusp. So the, the event is scheduled for the 31st of April and the 1st of May, and um, everybody is just on hold, but, but chomping at the bit, you know, to come. I was just able to announce um, before it happened that the Alan White band were going to be headlining. Absolutely. The, Moz Army meet for two nights. That would be Alan White, Gary Day, Spencer, um, and of course Craig Gannon, which would have been just incredible. Um, they were coming for Friday and Saturday. We had planned a tour around the UK, um, London, Birmingham, Leeds, Glasgow, various different places. We had booked all the venues, everything, so that we could get them to come over because everybody that works on the night of the Moz Army meet. It's a, it's a massive production and it takes a long time to plan, but everyone's a volunteer. Um, so nobody gets paid. So Andrew Parisi comes up every year, he gets his hotel room paid, but aside from that, everything else he does. Um, he drives up, he pays for his own meals, he, you know, he, he pays for himself because we want to give as much money to um, the Star and Garter as possible. And the reason for that is because the Star and Garter run a monthly Smith's Morrissey Disco, which they've been running now for 25 years. That's right. And they only charge five quid to get in and, you know, t two cans of lager. It's, it's, it's as low as, they keep the price as low as physically possible. Um, 
so that everybody can afford to go, as you've seen, at every, at every single age. And I think that's really admirable, you know, that they, their motivation isn't making money, it's making people happy. And they've made a lot of us so happy over the years, particularly all the regulars. It's This is our one thing that we do every that's year. Not, that's not my life in that place, to be fair. Me too. I mean, it's just, it's always so euphoric, that event. It's, I mean, it is a love for Morrissey and a love for the Smiths and the music, but a lot of the people who are meeting up actually know each other online. And, we, you know, we know each other through Twitter and Facebook and um, places like that because of that hashtag, because of that Moz Army hashtag where like-minded people want to connect in a positive way, in a non-political way, in a musical way, in a joyous sort of heart-lifting way. And, and because of that, everybody gets so excited at the run-up and yeah. then we all meet and each other. Like and, family, Julie. Yeah, and we're singing on the bus and we're all hugging each other. And, you know, there is a definite, it is such a joyous place and atmosphere and everybody supports everybody else and people turn up there alone and they're worried about going alone and, the, and then they leave and they've got hundreds of friends and you know the press come the, the, the NME have been and uh, obviously the Manchester Evening News come every year they love it mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know Morrissey's uh, family came um, as well and they loved it uh, so it's um, it's only for people who don't have any kind of a, a agenda if you know what I mean they just want to go see each other have a good time, have fun, meet their friends that they know from online, enjoy the music, sing their hearts out, have a dance, have a laugh and leave. And, and it's because of that, it's because the kind of genuine, kind nature of it that people love it so much. I agree totally. I mean, one of my most poignant memories of that place was, uh, I can remember one year I was having a particularly bad time. I was on my own, sat downstairs in the bar, uh, um, a bit of a sulk, and a, a particular Julie Hamill turns up, <laughs> walks over to me and kissed me on my arm, where it says, handsome devil. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Such a nice gesture, Julie. You, you nearly made me cry. Oh, I hate to see people alone. It takes so much effort for people to, you know, if it, people who suffer with mental illness as well and there's a lot of people like that in the Moz Army it takes so much for them to actually go to that event to even thinking of, uh, about going to that event or buying a ticket for it that when they get there and you see them there and you know that they've been worried it's a, it's a joy it's a celebration because they've overcome something that day that the battle that day to, to win and so I really want everybody that goes to have a good time I really want everybody to feel included if somebody if somebody came to that and, and felt excluded it would actually break my heart so i do target people who are sitting alone sorry paul <laughs> no it's quite all right well i've difficult to miss but i'm really pleased that you pointed me out there but uh, you're, ah, you're, you're, to, you're, to me, you're one of my best friends now as far as i'm concerned julie that Aww, improved it to me but, uh, and I, I, I don't know what this thing about naughty order brothers is i have no idea what that means I think you do. I think we both. <laughs> well, I think you, I mean, you really stand out online as a, as a great contributor and a positive force uh, to be reckoned with and somebody that's a bit cheeky. And I always um, tend to gravitate to those people, those cheeky Life people. Too serious, you know, about, yeah, I need a bit oh, yeah. of there. Yeah, and we have built up a little community of cheeky people, particularly less, less, so definitely some in the Moz Army, but there's a lot more on uh, listeners on the Boogaloo radio show where it, that's almost become like a little sub-family. People are giving each other grief and, you know, you're talking about you being naughty and what the shenanigans that you get up to and the cheek you give me when I'm on the air. And then wow. you've got Jeff, Jeff and his decorating and Andrew Clear and his pyjamas. <laughs> One big family, but uh, it keeps going. And I've, I've really actually, it's a... It's a must listen to every weekend now. So oh. I recommend everyone checking out Google Your Radio. Two o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. It's a, and, and you, you play some brilliant tunes, Julia. You've got such, yeah. a, such a great taste in music. And although you never play my jazz funk tunes, do you? I did, I have. You have? I yes, think you I have. Yes, as a matter of fact. Yeah. 
I have, I have, I think I've played them twice, actually. Paul twice. Ordle of the NWBs. I mean, I think that the the music thing is is really to do with age, and we, we're all of a similar age, I think, kind yeah, of 40s. 27. 50, uh, 14s and 15s. And... Um, we were so spoilt for choice when we were growing up in terms of what was in the charts. And, you know, I can tell there's a lot of hardcore music fans listen to that. And it's nice to be able to play something that isn't played very often to kind of pluck something out that has either been overlooked or is a bit unexpected. Oh, it's Even it, Such an yeah. person that when you play some music that you've not heard for 20 years, and you're thinking, what an amazing song that was. And yeah. we have a bit, where's that song been on my life? I've, I've missed it. So Yeah, totally. It's great fun. I mean, honestly, I'm sitting in the, the box like that. like In your cardboard I'm, box. Yeah. Yeah. I end up singing bits. I, I kind of forget, you know, the load of rubbish comes out of my mouth anyway, as you know, but I kind of forget sometimes and end up singing and the mic's on. <laughs> Sorry. You guys don't know about Julie's cardboard box. Literally, it's a, improvised radio studio in Julia's home and uh, if you would like to this is it and there she goes <laughs> Julia's cardboard box see the um the line sound that is you know, this is an exclusive Julie courtesy of uh Andrew Parisi Andrew Parisi so that's that's an exclusive the first time Julia Andrew Parisi's box has been aired on a Thursday <laughs> That's quite a first. Thanks, thanks for that premiere there, Julie. I appreciate that. Um, all exclusives I'm saving for you. And just as you're talking, I seem to have a workman outside with a, with a drill or something. Very professional. Oh, really? Right. Whilst we're, uh, whilst we're on the subject of, like I say, we, it might be a case that we'll have to play it by ear with regards to the, the Mars Army meet. And the reason yes. behind that is the, obviously the COVID-19 situation. So... Would you just give me a little insight into how that COVID-19 has affected your life this year, Julie? Oh, it's completely turned it upside down, Paul. I mean, everything I do is, I mean, I mean, I write, obviously, but any writer will tell you that, you, you know, you need nine other jobs to be able to sustain that as a living. You cannot make a living out of writing books. It has to be a passion and something that you just want to do because the royalties wouldn't pay for a, half a week shopping um but so all my other work is really presenting um do, doing stuff various bits of radio um presenting uh the Moz army meet which we know and um but the biggest one for me my biggest kind of other job is the rock and roll book club which Absolutely, is a monthly yes. monthly chat show uh, in camden and that's where um, I interview live on stage uh, people, famous people usually who have written books from the music industry and we play music from their book. And that is, I really love that. It's such a laugh. There's so much heckling. It's, it's work in terms of it's a lot of preparation and you want to ask interesting questions and you have to read the book and you have to know your subject inside out, so listen to all their music. But when it's somebody who you have been a fan of in your teenage years or something like that comes along and you get to interview them, like Madness or, you know, The Mission or people like that, it's just so exciting. It is the best job in the world. And, oh, and you know me, I don't really hide my excitement. So. No, you don't. It's quite <laughs> embarrassing at some points to be fair, Julie. <laughs> I know, sorry. Well, I'd probably just be the same. I mean, I was, I was a massive Madness fan at 13 years old. I thought there was a yeah. yeah. It just freaks me out that I know the band. It shouldn't. I'm really cool, calm and collected. You know, when I'm doing it, I'm trying to be yeah, right. Uh, trying to be, you know, professional and whatever. But it does. It isn't until a couple of days later that you go, oh, my God, I just interviewed Chris Difford from Squeeze or I just interviewed uh, Bedders from Madness or I just interviewed Wayne Hussey or Joel Wood or, or any of those people that you know I've be, I've done an event with. And oh, really, kind of... It's like the, the world famous photographer Alistair Morrison was telling yes. me last weekend they're just people. I know yeah they're yeah. Exactly no, the same I know. as me and you. They are and that's fine and I do you know treat them that way however 14 15 year old me yeah, is still, exactly. ex still exists in there and I have to allow her her minute 
of going of going what if you had told me you know 30 years on or whatever and do you have wine on hand during the interview uh wine yeah did you say um not on stage i don't drink don't drink when i'm working oh, that's, I would, a, that's a relief then because i can see you getting more and more closer to the to the uh, the uh, subject the more <laughs> wine we drink well i love red wine as you know um but i mean Absolutely. i have uh the, the guests often do bring their drinks to the stage uh, at the Rock and Roll Book Club. And, um, you know, I've, I've got a load of stories that I could tell you really about the rockest things that have happened. But uh, one, you know, I've literally watched them getting drunk as the interview progresses and begin to slur, begin to sing, fall off their chair. I've seen people in the audience come up, grab the mic, start singing. They're drunk as well. Um, Will Birch came on stage. Uh, Will is from was in the Casual Flyers, and he also wrote a book about Nick Lowe. And he came on stage one night, and he had his glass of wine, and he was reading a book, and he ended up throwing it all over me. <laughs> Just like I was like book, book and, rock and roll book club for no reason. Then is it? It's, 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 no, it, it it goes down, and we just let it go down. If there's a mistake, we just let it happen. In a similar way that mistakes always happen at the Moz Army meet and we all just go, oh, well, you know. Yeah. By the end of the <laughs> night, we're all in a circle, dancing around yeah. the sandbags together, singing along and, you know, it doesn't care. It doesn't matter what you look like. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And it's actually... It's about good. letting your hair down and having a laugh, isn't it, basically? Yeah. But it's, it's an age thing as well. I think we've all reached an age where we actually don't care anymore. You know, I think we all know that no, we are. Actually, no, no cares whatsoever. To be fair, it's, I'm well um, past those dealer. Yeah, and and you and you and that's a very freeing thing. I think because you because you know I know I'm a little bit odd, and I know that people think I'm a little bit odd and a bit quirky, and I'm sure they think the same of you and various other people that are in that community. In a nice but, way. But to actually have re reached the age where you've stopped caring is just and embrace your oddities and your quirkiness, then you that's when you're really free, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, by this stage of the game, Judith, if they can't accept us for who we are, then sorry, that's uh, their problem, not ours, I'm afraid. Yeah, but we I don't want them more. anyway. Sorry? <laughs> we don't want them anyway. No, of course <laughs> you don't. We're, we're fantastic as we are, Julie. <laughs> One we of us is. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, right, can I just, uh, I'm going to sound like a proper interview now, ask you some set questions like, well you have obviously travelled a little bit and yeah. I know your work's been very varied, so when it comes across famous people you've mentioned, who's the most famous person you've actually met? And I've um, got any interesting anecdotes in relation to that. Loads, loads. Oh, I've met loads of famous people Lo uh, since I started. Oh, so photograph of you. Is it you and Kiefer Sutherland? Yeah, I've met Kiefer, yeah. We had an interesting evening together. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Rutger Hauer, Bill Murray, Willie Nelson, uh, Tim Curry. Um, God, couldn't even... Sisters of Mercy, members of the Smiths, um, Patricia Morrison, you know, like loads. But the Kiefer thing... Um, oh, Nick Cave. Um, Kiefer, I was working in... Um, are you sure you've got time for this? Yeah, carry on. I will try and truncate it for you. I was okay. working on, in uh, advertising at the time. I was working out of New York in an agency called Ogilvy, and I was running the... Um, I think it was Motorola. Yeah, it was a Motorola account for North America. And we were going on a shoot. We were shooting a new phone and it was television. And we were staying in a hotel. And um, we went down to the hotel bar, myself and the team and the clients. And there were kind of about 10 of us in a circle. And we were, uh, you know, I was looking after the client. So I was like being all like, oh, what drinks would you like? And what can I get you? And all that. And oh, we're, okay, well, we'll have the drinks and we'll have the olives and, and the nibbles and whatever. And that was kind of sitting around the table and we we're talking about the launch of the new phone and the V60 and this and that and whatever. And I hear this voice behind my head and it's, got quite, it's quite a deep, gravelly voice. And I think, I know that voice. I recognise that voice. That is so odd. Who is that voice? And bear in mind that in my teenage years, next to the posters of Morrissey were posters of Kiefer Sutherland oh, yeah. in The Lost Boys. And okay. so there was Kiefer in The Lost Boys, also in Young Guns, that terrible cowboy film. And 
<laughs> and you know lots of like interviews and cut out bits and bobs sort of all over my room and I thought why do I know that voice and I'm like trying to be like all you know professional advertising you know <laughs> kind of like director you know like this like and then I turn around like this and I realize who it is and I turn back to the table and I just lose my cool completely lost all professionalism gone and I turn to the table and go oh my god everybody be cool that is Kiefer Sutherland behind me and they go what yeah he's been sitting there a while what's the he's been sitting there he's having like drinks with his girlfriend and I was like it's Kiefer Sutherland you guys like and I was like god god where is my um my uh, camera and oh, that was it I was also working about what's the reason with Australian people uh oh very funny <laughs> <laughs> they were Geordie. Oh, the Geordie, yes, okay. <laughs> I've told people about you're renowned for your, your accents and your impressions. On terrible. The Can't help it, it's terrible. Um, anyway, I had this one time use camera, disposable camera in my bag. And I just was sitting there almost like, like scratching, like really like nervous and going, I can't believe this. I couldn't concentrate on, I couldn't hold the discussion, nothing. And Keith, I saw Kiefer going to the loo with his uh, girlfriend was behind him. Surely. And I thought, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it again. Okay. So I got, went, got my little camera, went after him and was like, hi Kiefer, uh, my name's Julie. I was just wondering if we get a photo together. Uh, um, um, I, I'm, so, I'm not really anybody. I just want to get a little photograph. Uh, it's all right, you know. And he was like, are you Scottish? Uh, and I was like, oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm really, really Scottish. Yes, you can do that actually, okay? And he goes, I'm not going to take one photo because they might not have not all come out. I'm going to take lots of photos. Come on. He gave the camera to his girlfriend and he sort of started by kind of putting his arm around me and he was quite um, tactile, quite a sort of, you know, like, and, and quite um, chirpy shall we say. He'd, he'd been going to the loo quite a lot, I noticed, that, that evening. And um, he um, then started doing sort of, I don't <laughs> he started doing things like picking me up and, you know, holding me like this and holding me like that and whatever. And he goes, where are you sitting? Where are you sitting? We're going to come and join you. And I was like, I'm just over there. I'm with, sort of in a meeting at the moment. But um, it was really nice to meet you. And I thought, I'm never going to see him again. And then Next thing I know, I'm back retelling the story of what just happened to the rest of the clients at the table going, so this is what happened and he took a photo and he picked me up and oh my God, I hope they develop okay and everything's going to be all right. And then I hear behind me again, excuse me, excuse me, and it's Kiefer there shoving the person beside me along to pull his chair in to sit beside me, right? And, and I'm like... to. The, Everybody around the table knows because I've confessed my Kiefer love, teenage love. So they're all like <laughs> watching this unravel. And I'm like, um, this is Tim, this is Marie, this is this, this is that, this is this, this. Uh, uh, and he was like, okay, tell me about yourself. And then he began to just monopolize me until, and I was hypnotized until everybody left around the table and his girlfriend fell asleep on the couch and it was three o'clock in the morning. He was dropping Jack Daniels into his lager and I was still drinking wine and we were reciting the entire script of Lost Boys. <laughs> he was playing his part. That's the experience. He was playing his part and I was playing all the other parts. I mean, I've got myself into a few scrapes in my life, Judy, but that's among <laughs> the best. <laughs> It's so weird. He gave me his phone number and his email. Really? And, um, I emailed him afterwards when I got back to New York and he was like, you're a real fun girl. When I get back to New York, I'm going to contact you. We're going to go out. And um, uh, sorry, that was Louise just calling. And uh, Louise. I, yeah, she gets everywhere, honestly. But he, I then, um, I didn't hear from him for a while. And um Called him a couple of times. He hasn't called back, so still time. It's only Absolutely. what you never know. It's only eighteen years ago, maybe sixteen years ago, something like that. Well, thank <laughs> you for sharing that amazing memory, Julie. 
I can see that to uh, uh, something you never forget. Right. Yeah. Uh, what I'm going to ask you now, if, if you don't mind, um, can I ask you your? Um, I will keep it to three. Yeah. Julie Hamill, Paul, it's our dinner party. Who's the three people you'd invite? Oh God, I forgot you were going to ask me this. Um, Morrissey, obviously. Yeah, well, of course. Um, is it a, a, alive or dead, or is it, are they all got to be alive? Alive or dead. Uh, Robert De Niro. Yeah. Um, and I tell you who I really like, and I can't remember her name. Do you watch Gavin and Stacey, the mum in Gavin and Stacey? Yes. Her. I love her. <laughs> She's so funny. Well, thank you for that, Julie. And <laughs> um, what would you be your three desert, desert island discs if you had to pick three tunes? Um, three tunes I would pick. Uh, William, it was really nothing by the Smiths. Oh, um, I would pick The Rattler by Goodbye Mr McKenzie and I would pick November Spawn the Monster by Morrissey. You love that tune, don't you? Yeah, I do. I really do. I think it's so unique and I love the production on it and it's wild. It's, it's, it's Morrissey's best, I think. Just, it's just wild. Whilst I've got you on, Julie, I need to uh, mention the uh, product placement. Yes. I thought it would be a good idea to mention the books you've written. <laughs> you want to give us a quick, uh, you know, history of the, your, your titles? Uh, okay. Um, quick plug of the books, you mean? We've got to get the plug of the books in, Julie. Because <laughs> I'm going to put a link in, in, the, in the comments. Oh, awesome, you yes. You buy your books and give you a five-star rating. Yes, exactly. Yes, please. Um, well, for Morrissey fans, the first book I wrote sort of started as a blog um, in 2012, where I decided to start writing about what I love, and Morrissey had been a constant in my life. But every time I read about him, I read that he had done something bad. So I kept reading all miserable, pulp of mope, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, this is just boring. You know, there's people are not putting any imagination into this writing and it can't be true. I wonder if it's true. So I contacted Martin Evan from Fairground Attraction and Morrissey's co-writer on the Kill Uncle album. And I said, can I interview you? And I actually just expected him to ignore me. And he, and he said, yes. And, and I thought, well, I'll call, I'll call the interview 15 minutes with you. Because so probably these people are so busy and famous and songwriters. They will only have 15 minutes. Well, I was going to call this interview with you 15 minutes with Julie, but we've ever run, I'm afraid. Oh, no, sorry. No, carry on. I'm I, you okay. I don't know how that's happened. I'm not very chatty. <laughs> you're not very chatty she says <laughs> so um anyway i met with mark in highgate and uh, we went to a pub and four hours later four pints of guinness later uh we were still sitting there chat chat chatting away and i had this massively long tape of interview that i had to cut down and anyway i did that and i loved it it was obviously mm -hmm. thoroughly exciting and i sent it to mark and said this is what i'm gonna write and he said i love it he said you should meet Kevin Armstrong, you should meet uh, Clive Langer, you should meet these various different people. And I was like, ah! Oh. Then I went and met Kevin Armstrong and I went to his house and I met his wife and uh, it turned out he lived not far from me. So we became quite pally and I stayed friends with Mark. And then Kevin was like, who do you want to interview? And I said, I really want to interview Clive Langer. I'm a huge Langer, with Win Stanley fan. And obviously that was our era of music, you know, Madness, Success, John Morrissey and so on. And, um, he, uh, he was difficult to track down. I had to write him a letter. He was living in the Isle of Wight and then eventually met up with him, stayed friends with him, um, met up with Andrew Parisi, who's a brilliant friend. Oh, and Andrew. Yeah, and they all, of course, they all know each other, you know. So if I then get, I've had lunch a few times with Clive and Andrew and the stories, oh my God, forget Kiefer Sutherland, you know. The, I tell you what, the, way, the way you're talking, we're going to have to have a, a part two sometime. Oh, well. You've sorry. got so yes. much to talk about. I mean, so I take it by doing that, one one contributor led to the next. One and contributor so on led to the so next. That's exactly how it happened. It was like a chain. 
And then obviously there's a lot of really famous Morrissey fans and I started kind of speaking to them and I followed Frankie Boyle and said, Frankie, do you fancy doing an interview about Morrissey, your taste in music? Mm. And next thing it was Frankie Boyle is following you. I love you. Frankie Boyle, you know, Julie. Yeah, um, so do I. I think you think I'm some sort of mad stalker now. So I, I even know Julie Hamill, you know, and it's at that point I think it potentially blocked me. So yeah, I, he's I've talked to him for some reason because he doesn't know me. I'm just I think a, he blocked. I'm amazed he hasn't blocked me, but he, he, I think he blocks and uh, you know blocks first ask questions later. But he's actually a lovely, lovely man, really quietly spoken, not at all like how he is. No. Uh, Age, really sweet man, very generous as well. Loads of stories about him as well. We we sort of stayed, um, we stayed following each other. I won't say we've stayed friends, but so far he hasn't unfollowed me anyway. Well, if you ever get to talk to me, say Paul says hello and he's not a mad stalker. It's quite a nice chap. Well, that's if I can get near him. No, Paul, you know he'd probably take one look at me and go, "It's that mad stalker with that other mad stalker behind her." <laughs> so, in relation to other books, what we've got. Frank, is it? Yeah, so Frank and Jackie is part of a trilogy called the Life and Soul Trilogy. So, so when I was writing 15 Minutes with You, I never wanted to write in a journalistic way. I really dis dislike that kind of journalism style of writing. Even though I have written a few articles, you'll always be able to tell it's me because just a bit of me just sort of creeps in there. So they become more about you as a writer and you finding your voice and your personality. And I didn't, also didn't want to write to somebody else's agenda. Um, so I did write some, some music stuff uh, for, for online. But what I really wanted to write was fiction. Because if you read 15 Minutes with You and you read the interviews, the, they are not written in a way that, you know, they are, that they are in a newspaper. They're written as a little story, a little miniature story about yeah. one piece of person meeting another person. So... You know, the, the Martin Evan interview is, it was big cold weather as I walked down Highgate Hill and the wind or whatever it was, I can't remember. I didn't, I wanted it to be little miniature stories rather than um, straightforward, very dry. Why did you play that guitar in the key of C? And there's a place for that, but it's just not me. No. So that's when I thought, actually, what I really want to do is fiction. And I had done a degree in creative writing at the Open University and my tutor said, don't waste it. You've got this character, Frank, who I'd written a play about, uh, who was a solitary old man whose wife had died. She came back to haunt him and he wasn't sure why. So I began to explore Frank as a book and one chapter led to the next and then a publisher picked it up. And she said, um, We'd like you to do two, two more books after this. So Jackie came out in November last year, which is Frank's daughter. And uh, she's sort of her journey and um, her relationship with her mother and her mother's backstory and, of course, her own daughter. And then the third book I'm writing at the moment is called June, which is about the daughter, kind of the third generation, nice. who's named after the granny. Nice link. <laughs> It's just um, blowing when, out. When, like when do you expect that to be coming out, Julie? That'll be the end of next year because I was supposed to have written it this year. But when lockdown happened, we were talking about our struggles with lockdown and, and everything got wiped. I, I totally understood why the, the children who had been asked to work from home and do their homework from home found it very difficult because I couldn't write. I just couldn't do it. It wasn't in the right mind frame. It was... It, I need to be sort of busy and stimulated in order to have the energy to to, to focus on it. Yeah, absolutely. I felt my it's brain not been a, a great year to be conducive to that sort of thing. It's it's been yeah. difficult for everybody, I agree. Yeah. But, Some know. people have thrived on it though, haven't some people have been really productive and and I mean I, I have been productive in other ways, just not in that one. So no. like learning broadcast from home was very, very challenging because I'm well, technically to do a lot at home currently. I mean, I'm the same, I'm working from home currently and, well, I've, I've been shielding. I've been in the vulnerable group, so it's been a very challenging six months. But yeah. things like this, talking to you and speaking to Alistair through Zoom, it's kept me yeah. going. So, I mean, you've, we've got Alistair to thank for this, for this vlog. I'm He's glad, I'm 
Paul, I'm so proud of you. I'm really glad that you're doing it. You know, I know it's been a struggle for you and to see it not only come out, but to be successful and very natural and very you, to see, to see you thrive in this, you're doing exactly what you should be doing oh, thank now. You. <laughs> I'll, I'll get all emotional, don't, don't do that <laughs> you, but no, well, thank you very much. Uh, like I say, I'm, I'm playing at it now, we'll get back to as we go along. But when you've got fantastic people like yourself to talk to you, Julie, it's, you're going to feel very comfortable because you're such a nice person. Aww. It's easy to talk to you. Um, well, how much am I going to have to pay you for saying these nice things? I shall send the check in the post with my Christmas <laughs> card. And talking yeah, to yeah. Talk yeah, to go on. December, in fact, when yeah. this goes out, Julie, it will actually be your birthday. The third Yay! December. So I will say many happy returns for your birthday, Julie. Thank you very much, Paul. It's and, great to be uh, young. I'm going to plagiarise part of your 15 minutes with you and ask you if you'd say hello to my mum for me, please. So is is Anne, that, Anne your yes. mum? Happy birthday, Anne. Wow. Sagittarians are the best, aren't they? I mean, and look at what you produced in that, Paul. One half of the naughty Wardle brothers. I mean, what a cheek. Where would we be without him? You did well, Anne. Have a happy, happy birthday. And what a great birthday you've got. I can't imagine what it must be like to share your birthday with the likes of Taylor Swift and Julie Hamill. Have a great day. Thank you very much. That's absolutely fantastic. So <laughs> thank you so much for your time, Julie. Um, You're welcome. Uh, it's been a pleasure as always. So, yes, thank you, Paul. Always uh, a pleasure. Hello yeah. to Alistair as well. I will say hello to Alistair for you. Don't be a stranger. Yeah, I won't. I'll be listening out on Sunday. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing it. And for all your other instalments, keep doing it. Keep going. Thank you. Well, Stephen's popping around in a bit, so I might get an update on his bum for you. Oh, is he? Oh, well, good. Yeah, yeah definitely keep posted on that. And... I need to keep ahead of the, the clear bum news. Uh, yeah, clear the bum news, yeah. <laughs> the Lord's Lord, Lord, the bum news. <laughs> Put me off my chips, that did. Well, anyway, that's, that's not get me uh, excluded from YouTube before I even start. So <laughs> I better keep it clean, I suppose. Love to well, Stephen and all the family. And Paul Jr., future star. Oh, Paul Jr., yes, thank you for that. Yes, I'll, he'll be so pleased you mentioned him, as a matter of fact. Yeah, he's a cracker. Isn't he, bless he, you? If I was 500 years younger. Oh, blimey. <laughs> yeah, he'll be blushing. I'm blushing, thinking about it. Thank you very much. It runs in the family, Julie, you know. That's really inappropriate. Sorry, Paul Jr. I'm really sorry, Anne. <laughs> Right, so uh, I shall sign off to you before, before I get run out of the recording time. Okay. And I've had no problem at all filling this space. I can say you've been an absolute <laughs> pleasure to speak to. <laughs> so I shall catch up with you shortly, Julie. You're welcome, Paul. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Well, what can I say? The absolutely fantastic Julie Hamill. So, thank you for tuning in to this latest instalment from Ernest Patrell. That's obviously me, Paul Wardle, in conversation. And I will look forward to seeing you in the next instalment. Thank you. Bye-bye for now.